Most doctors, even OBGYNs, aren't taught to discuss genital comfort, function, and appearance. And to top it off, most insurance companies won't cover costs they deem cosmetic, even if function is affected. Let's begin with that awkward thing that we've all been through, which is puberty, okay? Our bodies change during puberty. In a girl's developing body, estrogen stimulates things to grow, most noticeably the breasts. But what you may not know is something else is being stimulated to grow down there, the inner lips of the labia minora. And just like the breasts, they can become larger, change color, and become uneven. I'm quite sure that many gentlemen out here can relate to issues concerning size. <laughs> but while I doubt many men will complain about their penis growing or developing body hair, it's different for young women. Back to the breasts for a minute. All girls grow breasts during puberty, but some grow bigger than others. For girls with extremely large breasts, this can dim their self-confidence and impact comfort in their ability to exercise. Some women will seek a breast reduction to address these issues and are happier because they sought a solution. When a woman feels good about her body, her confidence shines through. And just like the breasts, the same thing can happen to the inner labia. Yes, people, don't be afraid to say the word. Come on, say it with me, labia. Labia, labia. When there's more than average growth, it can be noticeable but not an inconvenience. With substantially more growth, however, it can be painful and physically problematic. Suddenly, there can be tissues sticking out, and it can be uncomfortable doing any physical activity, even sitting or walking or wearing certain clothes like jeans or swimwear. Hygiene can become a problem, and putting in tampons as well. And for older sexually active teens, sex can become unnaturally painful. Feeling abnormal or uncomfortable or experiencing pain or embarrassment can lead to feelings of depression and self-loathing during a time when girls should be embracing their body's changes. Body image is a huge issue for teens, and it's important as parents that you talk to your children about this and any concerns that they have. Most girls are mortified to talk to their parents about this or their doctors. And pediatricians rarely counsel the moms of preteen girls about the changes that may occur and what to expect and what they can do so they can better advise their daughters. OBGYNs don't ask during a pap smear, does this tissue bother you or get in the way? So it's your job to talk to your daughters about this. And although surgery is available, it's preferable to wait until 18 because their bodies are still developing. Unless the, your child's activities are severely restricted or she's in emotional distress or has chronic pain. Parents with, with preteen daughters, you should go home and give them a mirror and tell them to take a look. You should reassure them that there's nothing embarrassing about body development or sexual function. It's a natural part of growing up. And what's more important is to know what's normal for you and when something changes in a negative way that will impact you. And that way you have time to address it before bigger problems arise. Dads, your daughters probably don't even want you to know that they have their periods, but you can just let them know that you're there for them. Labia reduction has been a taboo thing between parents, patients, doctors, and insurance companies. And to make matters worse, most insurance contracted doctors are not trained to perform labiaplasty procedures. There's also a huge misperception that women are seeking labiaplasty strictly for cosmetic purposes. And having performed over 800 labia reductions, I can firmly state that that is not the case. My experience has been that this discomfort starts in puberty. And while it doesn't matter as much the size of the labia as the problems that they cause, it's imperative to destigmatize this part of the female anatomy. And more importantly, it's important to be comfortable in one's body can create happier daughters, sisters, and moms. Speaking of moms, we know puberty is just the beginning. Can you guess the next big event in a woman's life? Yep, it's having kids. And boy, do they change us. 
It could be the first baby or the fifth baby, and it can cause a wide variety of symptoms, from mild to severe, that can impact bladder, bowel, and sexual function, as well as the quality of their lives. And even though these are considered normal changes of childbirth, you don't have to live with them. Most OBGYNs will discuss losing the baby fat, but they won't talk about these more intimate concerns and the fact that there are treatment options available to restore this kind of function. So with the bladder, there's three kinds of incontinence, but we're just going to talk about the one that's related to childbirth. That's called stress urinary incontinence. And that's leakage of urine with coughing, sneezing, bending, laughing, lifting, jumping, all the things that you may do running after a toddler. <laughs> this is due to the lack of support of the bladder neck with increased abdominal pressure. Surgery, radiofrequency, and lasers can all support the bladder neck and help reduce urinary leakage. Bowel function can change too. Going to the bathroom used to be an in and out kind of thing, but after childbirth it can take time and effort. And ladies, like gentlemen, can get constipation and hemorrhoids. So not sexy. <laughs> and depending on how badly this is impaired, surgery can fix this. Now, weak vaginal muscles, weak vaginal opening muscles can cause a partner to fall out, compromising sexual function. This, plus reduced sensation for one or both partners, and air causing gas-like noises, are the most common reasons women seek doctors like myself to help restore function. And often when women go to their doctors and ask them what they can do, they're told to squeeze their muscles, but their muscles are no longer connected. Imagine the birth canal as this toilet paper roll, and it's cut from one end to the other. And this is before childbirth, this is after childbirth. So the fact is that there are surgeries and non-surgical options to help restore sexual function. Talking about sex, let's talk about how aging and gravity can impact sexual function as we go through the last major event, which is menopause. As we age, the hormones estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone decline, causing all kinds of symptoms like irritability, emotional distress, and temporary insanity. <laughs> these, these are symptoms of menopause, but they can also include a lack of energy, vaginal dryness causing painful sex, urinary leakage, and reduced orgasmic intensity. And many women also feel reduced desire, and so their partners may feel neglected, but not know why. Now, hormones have been given a bad rap, but they can be life-restoring for women that have no risk factors. Supplementing low hormones can restore a body's balance, but not all women can or want to take hormones. So you can treat menopausal symptoms with lasers and radiofrequency, which can restore moisture and tightness to the vaginal canal. And although these are not permanent solutions, they have almost no risks and have no downtime. Now, hysterectomies are also common during menopause, and these can happen because of bleeding problems, cancer, and because the uterus is literally falling out. Now, just like there are many reasons to have a hysterectomy, there are several kinds of hysterectomies you should know about. And you can have them with or without the cervix being taken out, or with or without the ovaries being removed. They can also be done through the abdomen or through the vagina. And I'm always surprised when I have patients that come to me and tell me they've had a hysterectomy, but don't know if they have their cervix or their ovaries. It's really important if you're going to have surgery that you know what's being done to you. You need to take ownership of your body, and that's the most important thing you can do. Don't be afraid to voice your concerns about your genitalia. Write down a list of your symptoms or questions and take that to your doctor. Information is power. And your doctor may or may not be qualified to help you, and if they can't, hopefully they can uh, refer you to somebody who can. Talking to women about their bodies has opened my eyes up to the depth that anatomy can affect the quality of their everyday lives. There are millions of women that have these issues, and there are physicians who can help. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>